Hey everyone who's joining, welcome to the Next Level Chasing panel. I'm, we're just gonna wait a couple minutes for people to join um, and then we'll get started with introductions. Wow, here we have 50 people. Oh God, maybe I shouldn't have been showing my bedroom in the background. I won't out this person because they only sent this to the panelists, but someone just said chasing is the best position, which we all might agree, but I don't think any beater would agree with any of us. <laughs> All right, so there's a fair amount of people coming in. I guess I'll wait to do your introductions because that's the more important part. And so hopefully everyone will be there by then. Um, but I will quickly introduce myself. Um, so my name is Ian. Uh, I'm a, I play Quidditch up in the Northeast of the US um, and I've played for Middlebury College and Major League Quidditch Boston, um, which is now the Forge. Um, and I've switched between chaser and keeper, um, and I'm super excited to be talking to everyone today, uh, especially just to learn from everyone here myself, honestly. <laughs> so um, yeah, this should be a fun panel. Also, thanks everyone who's joining us right now. Um, I'm just gonna wait maybe one or two more minutes and then let everyone else introduce themselves. So hopefully everyone's here by then. Man, reading these comments is already hilarious. Someone saying that you can score as a beater, you just have to beat the ball through the hoop, which is, is technically true. I think I've seen it happen once, maybe twice. I've more often seen the bludger save, though. Which is just as good. Yeah. All right, I think the number seems to be slowing down. So why don't we just get started? Um, for those who are just hopping on, uh, like I said before, my name is Ian. Uh, I've also played Keeper and Chaser, but this panel is not about me. This is about our wonderful guests and panelists. Um, and so let's get right into some introductions. Uh, Aaron, do you wanna introduce yourself first? We'll go alphabetically first name maybe. Well, yeah, uh, my name is Aaron Godesey. Uh, I started with UT um, a long time ago and currently play for Texas Cavalry. Carly, do you want to go next? Um, I'm Carly. I played for the University of Virginia Quidditch all four years. Um, I graduated last year, so I've been a little bit out of the Quidditch game, but I guess we all have because of the pandemic. I'm up next, right? 
Okay. I'm Grace. Um, I played for BU um, in college. And then after college, I played for um, QCB, then Revolution. And I am co-president of uh, Boston Pandas, which hopefully will happen in the fall. My next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Olive. I started out playing at Baylor um, in, back in 2014. And then um, I transferred over and I played for Austin Quidditch at UT. And then I played for Texas. Um, and then I graduated and played for Heat as well. So I'm excited to be here. Hey, guys. I'm Teddy. I started at RPI in college and played a season with Bosney, a season with Houston Cosmos, a season with Revs, and I'm looking forward to trying to stick around on Pandas. It's, it's a lot of teams you got going today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's just start jumping into some questions. Um, I think first of all, uh, hopefully everyone listening knows this, but chasing and Quidditch is the position that handles the quaffle. Um, and usually go down and try and score on offense and defending the hoops on defense. Um, obviously, Quidditch being a unique sport, let's just start off with um, how did each of you get started playing Chaser um, and what were some keys in helping you grow into that position? Uh, I'm just going to call on someone, I guess. Let's, let's start with Grace. Do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so funny story, I actually went to BU and I said, Hey, like Quidditch sounds interesting. So I, um, my freshman year, I like emailed the BU Quidditch team, got my dates, dates mixed up and showed up at the wrong time. <laughs> and then just like forgot about it for a couple of years. And then my junior year, um, Curtis Stoichoff got me into, to Quidditch and, uh, we were friends before that. He tried to get me to do beater, but, uh, I really like chasing. So, um, I'm definitely stuck with it because I have an athletic background. I like um, sports, enjoy it. And then uh, definitely the people that I've met um, has made it fun. Uh, Aaron, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, Sorry, Quidditch, one of my friends, one of my best friends from high school um, actually did a stay over at USC and he was lucky enough to be housed by August Lures, which is a throwback name. He's a former U.S. national team keeper way back in the day. Um, and then just by chance, he played Quidditch there, told me about it. So when I went to UT, I joined the team. Uh, I probably did chasing because it was probably the simplest of all the positions in regards to just overall strategy. Beating was always complicated, so stuck with chasing. forgot to unmute myself. Uh, Olive, what about you? Yeah, um, so I got into Quidditch. Um, it was, I just saw people practicing um, outside my dorm and I heard that they were like Quidditch side, so you know, I was interested and I went and checked it out. Um, and I started chasing because I thought it would be cool to score. <laughs> um, and I was originally like interested in trying out like all the positions but somehow I was always in a position where we needed a female chaser and so like that's kind of stuck with me <laughs> um but yeah also I have smaller hands so beating is kind of hard and uh Carly so I guess I got into Quidditch because my first year at college I knew I wanted to play a sport I'm always been very active and very competitive and I played basketball and soccer in high school um, and I knew I wanted to do something competitively so I tried out and I made the team and I guess I became a chaser because that's kind of the natural transition from the sports that I played in high school so it was a lot it was very easy for me to pick up. Gotcha and then Teddy? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of with Carly on this one. I played uh, basketball and soccer and baseball in high school. So chasing just felt like a very natural fit. Um, plus, like as the shortest kid my senior year in the high school basketball program, it was cool to be able to dunk <laughs> on tall hoop. 
but uh, I got into it because uh, I got cut from the soccer team my first week of school and needed to pick a freshman week activity and they had spots open and that was so I was lucky I guess but that's it cool um all right so for the rest of this conversation I think I'm just going to break up offensive and defensive side of things because um I feel like the mentality and the positioning of those is pretty different obviously um so Let's actually start on the defensive end of things um, and talk about uh, what it was like to develop as a defender um, and a chase a chaser defender um, and how you kind of learn to both because the ball is always moving how to play in a point position role but also an off ball and reading um, where the ball is moving um, what what helped you develop those skills uh, let's start with uh, let's start with all of this time. Okay, yeah. Um, so one thing I would say for sure is that was key in learning how to be a bit better defender is communication on pitch. Um, and it's something that people talk about a lot, but it's you, you see the effectiveness like when it's actually like played out, um, being able to constantly communicate with your teammates, knowing where everything is at a certain point, because you are trying your very best to keep your eyes on the ball and all the other offensive players and everyone coming at you and the beaters but realistically you can't really keep tabs on everything at the same time um, and so that communication is key and letting your teammates know know what's going on um, and having that coming back and something else that I definitely learned playing over the years I would say is just being more patient I'm a very like jumpy person I say like I have like quick instincts but um, as a newer player like I'd often get like cut off, you know, like I would go for like a fake or running too far up and not be able to get back far fast enough. So I think just being able to kind of like assess the situation better um, and not just be so hasty, um, that definitely helps as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go, Teddy. What about you? Yeah, so um, I'd say, you know, just kind of the same as like a lot of other sports, like the same basic principles in terms of chasing are always there. Like if you're on the ball, you know, everybody sees tackles and that's super impressive and you want to be able to tackle everybody. But if you can just keep your person in front of you, keep the ball in front of you and get the ball back out of their hands, that's just as good. You know what I mean? Especially if you, I mean, I think we'll get into it, but if you're undersized or something like that, just don't give up ground um, and keep the ball away from the hoop. And then off the ball, um, being able to see if you're in a man coverage, being able to see uh, the ball and where your person are. Um, and then obviously, you know, all have talked on how important communication is. So as you get into different nuances of whatever team strategy you might be in, whether it's a zone or a certain type of coverage, or if you're expecting help in a certain spot, you'll defend differently in different areas of the field since Quidditch is such a big area to cover defensively. Um, but definitely most important things are knowing where the ball and your person are and uh, communicating with your teammates. Uh, Carly, do you have anything to add to what's been said so far? Um, definitely everything that everyone said so far has been spot on. Um, I would add that defensively, Chasing, the stance is a lot like basketball. I found that there's a lot of parallels um, between the two. Obviously, you're not tackling people in basketball, but your first reaction in Quidditch doesn't need to be to tackle. As long as you're staying low in your stance, you have the ability to move and stay in front of someone. That's the key, especially to on-ball chasing. Um, as a small female player, I'm 5'4", I'm not that heavy i can stop a male chaser from driving just by staying in front of them because if they're going to drive through me they're going to trip over me and that's really all you need um off ball for defense it's about being aware of where all of your teammates are not only the other chasers but the beaters because those are very helpful if you know where they are you know where the next pass could go and that's when you can step in and then start your on-ball chasing and defensively. 
Gotcha. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything you want to add to, to that? Yeah, I think um, overall, like a thread that's been talked about is communication is so big, um, playing defense. Um, and then the way like I figured out defensively was just breaking it down to scenarios each play. Um, and um, as much as we chasers love that we think we're the best, you know, unfortunately those scenarios come down to the beaters. Like it, it's all about the beaters. Um, you know, if you have two bludgers on defense and they're coming down with the ball, you know, they're not going to drive. Like, why would they drive? They're not going to dunk it. They're going to get beat. So you play tight up to your man. You have one bludger and Max Havlin and Lulu are coming down with both bludgers you better be prepared to shade over and help because they're going to tear right through your one bludger and your point defender. So I think in the end, you can probably um, break down every scenario and have a list of scenarios defensively of, Hey, what am I going to do in this situation? Or what am I going to do in that situation? And then when those come up on the field, you're never kind of taken by surprise about the result. Grace, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, just quickly, just basics. I think Car when Carly was talking about how it relates to basketball, when you play defense in basketball, you want to be in between the person and the hoop. And so when they move, you're all, always like in between the person and the hoop. Um, that's on ball and off ball. Um, and just another thing to consider if you're off ball, you have to say, am I possibly help defense? If you're not, then you should be right on the person. If you are, then you can kind of, if you're our help defense for the point defender who might get beat out, um, then you might need to take a step back. Um, for me, I know I need to take space because it takes me longer to clean up for the defense, the point person, the point defender, but um, no matter where you are, you know, the person wants to go to the hoops. So you should never like beat on the side of them because then they can just beat you and get to the hoops faster than you. So um, that's just a basic thing I wanted to add. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one interesting thing to think about that applies to all of what you've been saying too, is that that could work if what, no matter what defensive set you're in, I think like whether that's a zone of some sort or a matchup defense, um, all of what you said applies and, and keeping the person you're marking or the area that you're marking, making sure that they don't have immediate access to the hoops, but that you're also communicating about where you need to be next, um, especially based on where your beaters and the other beaters are. Um, okay, so let's move into then individual matchups when you are on the defensive end. Um, what is it like when you're matching up against someone, whether they have the ball or don't have the ball? And um, how do you adjust your own skills so that you're ready to either tackle or um, get in the way of a pass of the other person that you're guarding? Um, let's start with, uh, let's start with Carly this time. So like I said, on ball chasing, I, if, if you have good defensive, baseline, I don't think that the size difference is necessarily as big of a deal because as long as you have help defense and your beaters backing you up, you can go up against someone who's bigger than you. I think off ball is actually where it starts to get tricky because if there's someone behind the hoops who's a foot taller than me, it can be hard for me to block that pass. And I think that's where communication comes into play where maybe you need a switch man. Um, and I guess that's depending on whether you're playing a man or a zone. My experience has always been zone, so I don't pick a matchup. If a guy who's a foot taller than me comes behind, like that's my man. And that means I might need to switch with my zone player or at very least stay in between him and where the pass is going to be at all times. Gotcha. Um, Teddy, what do you, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I like, I think that's a really good point. And I think a lot of the way to deal with that, like there's no one size fits all way to deal with it. Right. So if you're going up against a person that's two steps faster than you, um, you need to kind of identify situations like Arian was talking about and like, is this, am I at risk for this person going back door behind me or do I have help there? If you need to keep them from going in a certain area, you know, take two steps off of them. If your beaters are pressing, it doesn't matter if they're way bigger than you or whatever, you should get 
as close to them as possible, try to disrupt their ability to get both hands up to catch the ball, disrupt their ability to get a clean jump, you know. And so there's lots of little, you know, gray area tricks and tips that you can use to kind of uh, just make it difficult for them. The most important thing for being def being a defender in a sport where it's hard to defend, you know, like Quidditch where you don't have to dribble or anything like that, is you need to make the other team uh, uncomfortable. So no matter kind of what you might be going off against, if you can know what they might like to do, or what they might want to do, try to take their best options away from them. And especially like go into that game plan with the rest of your team in mind uh, and working with them. Uh, Grace, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, um, just for defense, if anyone who wants to get better at defense, it's a lot of footwork. So la like drills, like ladders and stuff, getting your feet moving um, is very, very helpful. I'm not the fastest person, but I can move my feet in a way that I can defend against someone who's faster than me. I'm always like looking at their hips, not their head. Their head will fake you out. You look at their hips, you center. Like, so sometimes um, if I'm going against someone that's much bigger than me and I feel like I can't tackle them by myself, I might square my hips in a way that pushes them towards Teddy's side. So I might angle my hips in a way that I know if I need help on a tackle, Teddy will be right there and be able to tackle him. So I think as much you pr obviously practice your footwork, um, obviously practice your tackling, um, even though a lot of female players might be small, like Carly was talking about, there is a way to tackle no matter, you know, who's coming at you use their, their momentum. Um, but work with your teammates, right? Like it's okay to rely on someone who's better at tackling than you. So um, that's something that I wanted to add. Um, Arian, how about you? Do you have anything to add to what's been said so far? Yeah, I think on an individual basis, um, us as chasers, I think we underestimate sometimes how much we can influence what the offense does based on our positioning. So if I'm on ball against someone that I know I can't tackle, I have lucky enough to have Marty and Casey to my left and right, I'm going to position myself to the left of that chaser so that they can go to the left or to the right. And I'm pushing them that way. They may not, they may think that they're making that decision, but I'm influencing, influencing them to go that way so that I can push them to a stronger point defender. And I think similarly off ball in regards to just size, you know, like if someone's a foot taller than me, I can't really change that situation, but one way I can change it is maybe the pass that comes into them. Like if I'm super tight on them, that pass is naturally going to be high because that's what you're looking for. If I space myself two to three yards away from them, maybe if that chaser just does a push pass to him or her, I can jump that pass. So there's a lot of things you can influence as an individual chaser on the field based on positioning and little tricks that you can, you can do. For sure. And then Olive, do you have anything you want to add to all this? Oh yeah, um, definitely to reiterate what Aaron um, went over about like knowing where your help is um, is very important. Like when you're um, when you're chasing and you're when you're defending, um, knowing which way that you want to like edge the player towards. Um, especially it's kind of like looking up at the matchup, you know, like knowing your size against the person that's coming down. Um, and he also mentioned like situations. So if we have like two beat two bludgers um, on defense and they're not going to drive, um, Teddy mentioned making them uncomfortable. And a lot of times I think people forget that sport is a lot of a mental game. Um, and so if you're getting up in their face and you're like making you, you know, you're like have your hands up, you're getting in their way, like over time, they're gonna get frustrated and make a bad pass. So all those little things like add up. Um, so I think it's, you know, like don't underestimate the impact that you can have on the game. Um, and when you're on ball, you know, footwork, like uh, Grace mentioned, go low, keep your hands up because you never know like what you're gonna grab. I've blocked so many passes by accident just by having my hands up. <laughs> so yeah, that's about it. Um, great. So uh, I guess quickly before we switch gears and, and look more at the offensive side of things, 
Um, are there any just drills or things um, for people to work on uh, that you've found effective in helping you grow as a chaser defender? That can be on ball or off ball. Um, uh, so let's start. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm forgetting who hasn't had a chance to start us off yet. Um, but let's let's go with Arian. Uh, I think one of my favorite drills is just kind of shadowing. Um, basically, all offensive chaser. You don't even need hoops for this, but they just have they just running at you, making cuts, going back and forth, just trying to juke you out, and all you're trying to do is just stay in front of them. Um, I feel like as an on-ball chaser, half the battle is making sure you stay in front of your defender. Um, once they get by you, once they get a step, you're kind of, it's kind of over. But if you can keep them in front of you, you have a fight the chance. Uh, Grace, do you have anything, any other drills? Um. Yeah, I think if you're just in general, if you're a female player, like watch how other female players tackle. I think, you know, when I was taught how to tackle, I made small little adjustments to the typical way and I found a way that it worked for me. So um, that's just something that I've worked on in a specific drill with like only women or non-binary players that has been really helpful. Um, is figuring out a certain way and adjustment that you can make for tackling. Um, Carly, do you have anything to add to? Um, real quick before I talk about a drill, um, to add to Grace's point about tackling, the best way I've found to tackle as a smaller individual is to hook the ball arm the ball carrying arm so you use your elbow and hook it into their elbow and then i know that the rules have changed so now you can do two two arm tackles um then you can go in with your other arm once you've gotten control of where the ball is because that's what the ball carrier is most focused on um, rather than kind of wrapping around the waist because you know if you're smaller that's not going to do much so throw over top of you um, as for defensive drills uh, something that I found to be very helpful with my team, uh, it, it, I pulled from a basketball drill where it's kind of on ball help side, where whoever's on ball, talking like they're on ball, hands up in the air like they're on ball, getting in passing lanes, that kind of thing. And the person that's off ball also talking. And then you pass back and forth to two people up top and you work on that switching mo movement so that you're working your cardio, you're working your communication skills, and you're being aware of your surroundings. If you need more information on that, because I know it's hard to visualize when you're just talking about it, you can message me. I can give more information. Um. I guess I'm trying to move a little quick, but uh, Olive or Teddy, do either of you have any other quick drills you want to mention before we move on? Uh, I have a quick drill, but if Olive has one, she can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, so a quick drill I like is one very similar to the way Carly has it. Um, I use it where we'll start with just a coach or somebody in the middle, and you have two on two where two offensive chasers, two defensive chasers. Um, everyone's off the ball because the coach has the ball. Offensive chasers have to work to get themselves open for an entry pass. Um, so during that time, both chasers defensively are working on their off ball skills, staying in front, their positioning. And then once the ball gets into an offensive chaser, then it's live. So now all of a sudden, you're no longer denying on the wing. You're now in a help position because your other teammate is on the ball. So you're working on basically kind of a little bit of everything where you get off the ball denial, on the ball, communicating with your teammate, helping the gap. Um, and then other things, I think a really good way to integrate defensive skills, you can do it into conditioning where like, you know, everybody's in defensive stance and coaches pointing this way, this way, this way, this way, and you follow them as such and work on talking while you do that. Um, can also just look at any of Ashton Jean Lewis's uh, Instagram videos because he's got the cones out pretty much every day and he's sliding back and forth and 
it, you know, repetition makes you faster. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was just going to mention, um, you can never go wrong with, you know, catch and shoot. Um, especially when you have like, um, you can do like a timer drill where you have a certain number of seconds to take the shot and you do have beaters at the hoop. So it gives you that practice making decisions under pressure. Um, and so just the repetition of that just gets better. Um, and then just in general, like just working on footwork, like that will always help like defensively and offensively. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. So we're going to move into talking more about offense. I know we're, I guess, running a little on time, but some of the questions are also talking about offense. Um, so hopefully this should work out well. Um, so the first one I'll propose is just, uh, regardless of where any of you like typically play or not, um, you, I feel like I've all played successfully in different roles as chaser on the different teams you've been on. Um, so how do you grow into being more comfortable with the quaffle in your hands? Um, that doesn't mean you have to be the primary ball handler, but just as a player on the field, how do you get comfortable when the ball is in your hands in an offensive position? Um, let's start with all of this time. Okay, um, I just want to mention um, just knowing where your options are and always thinking about your next move. Um, so whenever you have the ball in your hands, I think something that a lot of inexperienced players feel is that kind of pressure or the panic to just kind of get it off your hands immediately. Um, but if you know where your options are and you know where the other team's beaters are, then you know you don't need to make a hurried decision. You can make the best choice. Um, and, you know, just practice. <laughs> you have to get uncomfortable doing this um, over and over again, and you'll get better at it eventually. Uh, Carly, do you have anything to add to that? So in addition to knowing uh, where your options are, I would say before you've even gotten the ball, you should know what your positioning is. So you're going, if you're, if you're the next option for the ball carrier, you should be positioning yourself in a way that you know you'll be comfortable once you get the ball. So knowing what defensive player is gonna step to you where the beaters are, making sure you're not in a position where you're immediately gonna get beat is going to take a load of pressure off you so that you can get the ball, gather yourself and look for your next pass. Um, I would say that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, it's hard to learn when you're a new player because you're not used to the beating element, but I think that's the biggest step that you need to take in order to be comfortable with the ball. Um, I'm just going to throw it out to the rest of you, Teddy, Arian, and Grace, um, just because of time. Uh, do, do any of you have points to add to what's already been said? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, in regards to, I just want to reiterate again how important what Carly said is. It's like it's so important. Um, and then what I used to do as like kind of a young chaser when I played for UT was if there was a, if there was a, if there ever was a stoppage or there was kind of a lull in the game. I would close my eyes and then I would say in my mind where everyone was, where are my chasers, where are their chasers, where are our beaters? And then I would see if I was right. Kind of now it's secondhand where when I'm playing, I know where everyone is. I know where the beaters are. I know where the chasers are. I know where the keeper is. I know everything. So that when I get the ball, I'm never surprised. I'm never surprised by their beater running at me and trying to beat me because when I got the ball, I knew that's what they were going to do. And then in regards to just basic ball carrying, you know, make mistakes, you know, I practice, make mistakes constantly, like learn from those mistakes so that in games, you don't, you don't do those. Yeah. I just want to add to be an effective ball carrier. You have to make yourself a threat because if you have the ball in front of the hoops and nobody steps to you, then you need to take that shot. You need to be in a good spot to take that shot right? If you have the ball and you're not like, it's hard because there's ball anxiety, right? It's for a lot of people having the ball and being not confident enough to shoot or not confident enough to drive, right? So you kind of have to fake it till you make it. And 
in order to be an effective ball carrier, the other team has to think that you're going to do something dangerous with the ball. Um, and part of that is having confidence or faking it. And if they don't step to you, then take a shot and then they're going to regret it the next time. Um, because they, Pete, the defense needs to react for the field to be open. Someone needs to step to me and then someone else is open, right? The, the beater needs to beat me so that when I'm driving, I can dish it off. Or if no one steps to me, I need to shoot it. So you need to be dangerous. And, um, in order to do that, you kind of have to get over that ball anxiety and have the ball as much as you can. Easier said than done, but yeah. <laughs> And uh, danger is not just making shots, right? It's like just being aggressive. Like you, you got to let the ball rip. You don't make any shots without shooting it. Um, and I think this is kind of coaching related, but like it's important to, as players are trying to learn this, like remind them that the most important thing is getting a good shot not whether it goes that you can't control when the ball bounces in or if you get stuffed at the hoops or a last second great beat or something like that, but you can control if you guys make good decisions and try to take what the defense gives you and, and punish them for it. So it's, it's important to just, you know, let it rip, you know, screw around and see what happens. Yeah. I think the recognizing the opportunities you have in front of you and being aggressive about it, obviously it takes time to develop those skills and hopefully, um, Hopefully your coaches will let you do that in practice. Um, and if not, then try to advocate for yourself as much as you can to put yourself in those positions to grow and learn so that when game time comes, um, you are more likely to succeed. Um, and if you don't, then just try it again the next play. Having that mindset is, it's tough to do, but it can be super helpful. Um, so moving into some questions from the Q and A, um, there's one, uh, specifically just about um, developing off ball uh, as a chaser on offense and finding the right cuts uh, to make to get yourself open and, and help your team be that more dangerous threat. Um, yeah, so let's start with, uh, let's start with Grace this time. Um, what have you found to be effective at getting open off ball? Yeah, so um, it depends on if you're the marked or unmarked chaser. Oftentimes I play the unmarked chaser position. So if I'm off ball and I get the ball in my hands. Um, like I said, you need to put yourself in a dangerous spot. So either I'm taking, I'm taking a couple steps forward so that the defense has to react to me, or I'm setting a pick picks. So I love picks. Um, if for anyone who doesn't know, a pick is when you, um, help your fellow, um, I don't know, whoever has the ball or can be someone who doesn't have the ball too but you stand in front of their defender and then your teammate goes past them. And so then, then your new teammate is open. Um, it opens up a lot of space. So I'm a big proponent for um, picks. And also when you're off ball, keep moving, don't stay in one spot. Um, especially if you're by the hoops, don't make a cut and stay there because the defense knows you're already there. So always keep moving and set picks if you don't know what else to do. Uh, Teddy, do you want to have that? Sure. Um, I think Grace brings up a really good point, and it's not uh, independent of what you're talking about before about offensively, the best way for the team to be successful is for everyone to be a threat to score. Um, and you do not need the ball in your hands to be a threat to score. Um, other thing to advocate for screens, whether you're marked or not marked, a lot of the time, like, so a screen will help your teammate get open but a good screen will make you the most open person on the field, right? That's why I like, if you look at like flex offenses and basketball uh, and things like that, it's, they are designed to get the screener open. Um, and it just puts a lot of pressure on the defense if you guys are on the same page about it. Um, and I would say definitely anybody, especially from the unmarked chaser position, uh, I know the midline hasn't had anything out in a while, but Grace put out an incredible um, series on that. A lot of great game footage, like here it is in your face, examples of like, this is how you can be effective from this position and really punish defenses for having to pick their poison about which space to leave open. Um, so I definitely say go check that out. Uh, Olive, do you have anything to add? 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to say you both, uh, Teddy and Grace, both made very strong points um, about like setting screens. Um, and then I'll say one thing to add is just making sure that your ball carrier always has an option. You know, there are a lot of times when, you know, theaters kind of go crazy and everyone's beat out um, and then they're like running down and they are the only one out there um, or too far off. So always making sure you're in a position to actually help if you need to, or making sure that there's someone there to help. Um, like Grace mentioned, don't stay in one place, like keep moving for an opportunity. And also communicate, like communicating with your teammates because this is something that can, can go off. Um, it's, sorry, this is something that could be used um, or just not used at all, but um, letting your teammates know like, hey, I like the ball, like, on this end of the pitch or at this height or like this level or you know up against this person and so when those scenarios come up you already are kind of in sync you know what you're expecting to do um and so it just kind of helps like build chemistry and help the flow of the game a lot uh how about you erin do you have any additional thoughts uh no i don't think teddy and grace and all covered most of it. Um, one thing I would add is just that as an off ball chaser, um, communication is something that's big. Um, as a ball carrier, there's so much going on on the field that um, it's hard to sometimes realize if something's happening, something isn't happening, if there's an opening. And as an off ball chaser, you can just sit back to a certain extent and you can view the whole field and see what's going on. And if you see that, hey, uh, we bought our one bludger down and we lost it you're yelling to your chaser, like, hey, we're about to get, like, pressed out of nowhere, like, get back. And they might not notice that, but you as an off-ball chaser who can see everything can communicate that in any way you want. Carly, any final thoughts before we move on? Uh, yeah, real quick, just to go back to the basics, um, to break it down, you have four quaffle carrying players on offense and I like to think of offense kind of like a diamond you have at the top of your diamond the ball carrier you have two passing options and then you have the person who's most opposite of the ball to be a good off ball chaser you need to know where you are in that diamond if you are supposed to be one of the passing options you better be an open passing option because of the way chase, chasing defense works with there being not only chasers, but beaters, if you don't have both of those options being good options, you're significantly limiting your offense. Then as the person who's farthest away from the ball carrier, you're most likely to be an unmarked individual. You are going to be the person with the best ability to make an easy dunk. So you need to be looking for those cuts when they're open and making them and then being prepared to become a passing option when the ball moves. So just knowing where you are in that diamond at all times is what's going to allow your offense to be most flexible. Great. Um, so building off of what you just said, Carly, and then I'm just going to kind of propose this to all of you and whoever um, wants to answer, we can uh, just hopefully so we can get through more questions. I don't think we all have to answer this one, but we talked a lot about being dangerous as an off ball threat and finding the space to score. Um, but then Carly brought up knowing what position you're in. Uh, and so someone asked about being open as a safety option for your teammates. Um, so does anyone have an answer just like what you can do, how to know that you're in the position as a chaser when you're off ball to have to be that safety valve um, for either a reset or just a, an outlet pass to get away from the beaters? I think, it, oh, sorry, Carly, were you going to go? Uh, I wasn't sure if he wanted me to just continue, but you got, you got it. <laughs> um, so safety option it's an interesting question I don't think as a chaser you ever want to take yourself out of a dangerous position to be in like a really open position I think you need to figure out a way to combine those so 
I think spacing is kind of the most important thing, making sure you're spaced away from the defense, spaced away from the beater so that you're open, even if they're close. Don't take yourself too far out of the play that you're no longer a threat because that is just going to slow down your offense and take everyone a while to kind of get into the group. Uh, I, I think quickly in regards to safety yeah. option, um, I think it all depends on the beaters again. Um, if, you know, I see that we're bringing our one bludger down and they get beat, I'm immediately like, okay, offensively, we're kind of done. Like, we got to get back and help out our ball care because you're about to get pressed. Um, so I think it depends a lot on what the defense is showing you in regards to when to kind of flip that, hey, I'm going to be a safety option. Um, Um, yeah, there are it, definitely. Oh, sorry. And there are definitely. I was just going to ask if anyone wanted to add anything. So, okay. I, I would like to add something. Thank you for asking. Uh, there are definitely situations where it's, it's about identifying the situation, like Arian was saying, where sometimes uh, it's more valuable to keep possession of the ball um, than it is to, to press. But I see where Carly's coming from when she says, you can't let your like so if you just possess the ball for an extra one flat pass in front of your own in front of the midline or whatever and you just get beat on the next pass and lose possession there like you have to be able to be available but still provide pressure um and in situations where you're not getting pressed it's about taking what the defense gives you right so no based on whatever your offensive philosophy is if you want to be flat to the ball or if you want to be at an angle or if you're behind hoops wherever you might want to be um if the defense is giving you one thing and it's within your offense take it um if they're trying to force you in one way don't necessarily be too stubborn about it space is space and if you can be effective and go set a screen or go make a good cut that puts pressure on um just whatever you do have confidence in it um what's worse than like making a mistake is making a mistake and being hesitant about it. If you cut hard, even if it ends up going into somebody or whatever, like let's say a beater taps you out, it might open up a play. Like you might feel dumb. You just ran to a beater, but it might actually open up a play for your beaters to clear out the middle. Um, so it's kind of like when you're on the ball, feel free to make mistakes. Like whatever you do, just go hard. Great. Um, so to kind of close this out, um, Let's, I know this is going to be really tough, uh, but let's think again to fundamentals and just, I want to hear what each of you would boil down to either a sentence or a couple words um, for key things to focus on or to work on to be an effective chaser, just generally. I know we, we broke up offensive defense, but to close this out, what, what are your, what's your like one sentence take on how to be and grow into an effective chaser? Um, and if I'm going to kind of give you a second and then whoever feels ready, uh, just feel free to jump in. I have two sentences and then I'll stop talking and let everyone else talk. The first sentence is be hard to guard. And the second sentence is sports are opposites. So that way it applies to both. So offensively, be hard to guard and that, you know, make your defender work their ass off. Defensively, if you outwork the person you're guarding, it's going to make their day really hard. Like, it should be easy to play offense in most sports. And if you're absolutely, like, giving them no space, making them uncomfortable the whole time, making them work for every cut, um, you're going to be successful. And so if you apply that to both sides of the ball, you can be dangerous. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll go. I think talking, over talking, asking for what you need, telling your teammates what you need, asking questions is really important. Um, and then just practice with the ball in your hands. Um, those are the two things I would say. So I'll say situational awareness on offense. And for defense, stay in front, stay low.
Okay. Um, in general, I would say awareness and conditioning um, because you have to always know what's going on at the pitch, whether you're on offense or defense and just sharpening your awareness um, will play like such a big role in making you a more effective chaser um, and in conditioning, like Teddy mentioned, make it hard for them to guard you. And if you're in great shape, you can definitely work harder than the person that's coming at you. Um, and communication, keep talking like in every different way possible. I would say probably be the most prepared person on the pitch. Um, know what you want offensively, know what you want to do defensively, know what they want to do offensively, know what they want to do defensively, and you'll be successful. Awesome. So I think we are technically out of time. Um, but there is the Slack channel uh, for this panel that I'll, I'm going through. I'm going to copy all the questions um, and make sure that we get to ones that we didn't answer um, so that hopefully any of us can answer those for you. Um, and also, I just want to say one thing I feel like everyone has made clear throughout this whole conference or the QuidCon is just don't be afraid to reach out and ask people these questions outside of the event after this weekend. Um, keep growing and learning um, and becoming a better player if that's what you want to do. Um, so, yeah, thanks again, all of you, for joining me um, and for sharing your insights. And thanks, all of you, for listening. Um, take care, everyone. <laughs>